Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, April 3rd, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here are tonight's top stories. Tonight, the hypocrisy of the Iran agreement. Then, a victim of Cuba's internment camp speaks out. And is it entertainment or predictive programming? That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I got one that can see. Get in there and deal with them right now. Scanning. Zzz, control. Zzz, manipulate scientific data. Zzz, take over. Blast control. World government. The United States, together with our allies and partners, has reached a historic understanding with Iran, which, if fully implemented, will prevent it from obtaining a nuclear weapon. The Islamic Republic of Iran has been advancing its nuclear program for decades. Today, after many months of tough, principled diplomacy, we have achieved the framework for that deal. And it is a good deal. Well, just hours after President Obama trotted out to give that formal announcement, some cracks began to emerge in this preliminary negotiation. Now, the United States, they immediately insisted in public statements and a fact sheet that they released that the sanctions on the country would be suspended or phased out over time after a final deal is inked. And they said they'd also be leaving in place any possible punishing actions if Iran were to renege on the deal. But just a few hours after that, Iran's foreign minister, who was the country's chief representative at these talks, suggested on Twitter that that's not what he agreed to, and he kept tweeting things out like the sanctions are to be terminated without delay. We would see these sanctions lifted immediately. Now, when asked about this, the State Department spokesperson Marie Harf said, oh, well, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what the, their misrepresentation are that they're telling to their citizens. Uh, she said she doesn't know what Iran might have claimed in their own fact sheet because she doesn't speak Farsi which is obviously the native language there in Iran. I don't speak Farsi either, but I can read those tweets, which are right there in English. Uh, this is what he is immediately saying, countering the claims made by President Obama. Um, and she also went on to say that she was not really concerned about how the country would sell the plan to its citizens. So should we be concerned about how our president is selling the plan to it's this nation's citizens. Now, basically, who is telling the truth about this deal? It seemed to have popped up out of nowhere. It's a, an about face was made practically overnight about making these uh, nuclear negotiations with Iran. Now, Phyllis Bennis says that forces aligned in opposition to this Iranian agreement uh, in Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Israel would rather see war than see uh, Iran brought out of sanctions and back into play as a regional power. What is threatened by an agreement like this is not the possibility of, of an Iranian nuclear weapon. All 16 of the U.S. Uh, intelligence agencies agree that Iran has not even made the decision to try to build a nuclear weapon, let alone have the ability to do so right away. But it's the fear that, number one, it challenges Israel's nuclear hegemony in the region. Israel right now is the only nuclear weapons country in the region. So Israel is obviously voicing their opinion that this is a move toward giving Iran nuclear weapons, and obviously we know the implications of what that could have for the region. But this is also signaling a shift away from the really tight relationship that the United States has had with Israel for more than half of a century. We've almost guaranteed to always be uh, their ally and support them. Now, Kurt Nimmo points out the hypocrisy behind this Iranian nuclear agreement. The Obama administration admits that Iran is not developing nuclear weapons, but despite that reality, the U.S. and Israel continue to insist that this third world nation is a threat. But the U.S. and Israel are more of a threat than Iran. Now, this is basically what Nimmo is saying. These threats by Netanyahu is really to make sure that Israel is the only nuclear power in the region, and they want to force the neighboring countries to accept them as a state, despite the way that Israel has treated and continues to treat Palestinians and its neighbors, in particular Lebanon, which 
Uh, Israel has invaded on five different occasions. Now, Warren Moss notes that one wonders if the reasons why these big powers like to push Iran around so much is because of the fact that it has such a weak, weak military. Now, he writes that China is estimated to have about 250 nuclear warheads, yet there's no call to impose sanctions on that communist tyranny. And maybe it's because it also has a military of more than 2 million active and 2 million reserve personnel, uh, also armored fighting vehicles, aircraft, and naval vessels, of course. Iran, on the other hand, has not attacked another nation in over 500 years, even though it was attacked with the blessing of the United States by Saddam Hussein's Iraq and has suffered economic sanctions that have been imposed on it by the United States and Europe. And lastly, the United States is the only nation to have ever used nuclear weapons. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear bombings targeted civilians and killed nearly 130,000 of them. Now, Russia, China, the UK, France, India, Pakistan, and Israel all have nuclear weapons. So one really has to wonder what's going on there, but we're definitely, definitely witnessing a major power shift in the region. Um, and as Marie Harf herself pointed out, the State Department spokesperson, how are we supposed to believe the story that we're being sold about this agreement? Religious infighting in the Middle East has been tied to religious prophecies for centuries. Now, coming up, I'm going to report on this weekend's Blood Moon, which is the third in a Tetrad series that falls on another auspicious date. And many believe that it has ties to the shifts in political power that we are witnessing right now. Now, more concerned citizens are speaking up about this Jade Helm military exercise, this time footage of troops interning citizens in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, has caused a victim of Fidel Castro's roundup to speak out. This is in a letter to the editor of the Corvallis Gazette Times. Larry Daly remarks that he was shocked to see video out of Fort Lauderdale which featured military and police training together to arrest citizens and take them to internment facilities. He says, it has been more than 55 years since 1961 and Castro ordered the roundup of suspected resistors in Cuba. According to some press reports, in excess of 200,000 were arrested during the Bay of Pigs. Now he goes on to describe the experience that he and his sister suffered through, but he says his memories were stirred after reading about Jade Helm, which of course is a realistic military training exercise that'll involve the Green Beret, Navy SEALs, the 82nd Airborne Division, and of course, local law enforcement. And it's set to take place from July 15th through September 15th. And the big warning here is that during this exercise, troops will attempt to operate undetected amongst civilian populations to see if they can infiltrate without being noticed. And again, that's, that's what we're saying here. It's not that we're saying martial law is coming this summer, but we're saying every single American, not just those who've actually been through a government ordered roundup, all Americans should be concerned when they see the military training in our cities, training there, rounding up citizens, working alongside local law enforcement, seeing if they can infiltrate civilian areas, uh, unrecognized, rounding up dissidents. As Joe Biggs has said, you train for how you're going to fight. Now, coming up next week, John Bowne is going to be giving us another in-depth report on a precursor to Jade Helm. This is called the Phoenix Program. And someone there said it's a, uh, central to Phoenix is the fact that it targeted citizens and not soldiers. Well, new details emerged today about just a handful of fighters from the Shabab militant group how they were able to kill nearly 150 students in Kenya's worst terrorist attack since the 1998 bombing of the United States Embassy in Nairobi. They only had a few light weapons. Well, the students report that militants shouted, come out and live, stay inside if you want to die. Now, they report that many fell for this trick they voluntarily left their dorm rooms and obeyed commands to lie down in neat rows only to be shot in the back of the head. Now, the students say they were pretty surprised with all of this because the university had been warned 
that there was the possibility for terrorist attacks. And this campus was in an area that had been targeted uh, several times in the past by the Shabab militants, and there were only two security guards there on the campus. Yesterday, we brought you the news about a mass shooting, a campus shooting in Kenya. The terrorist group Al-Shabaab opened fire at Garissa University College and killed nearly 150 people. Fox News reported the men were going door to door, asking people their religion, and if they answered they were a Christian, they shot them on the spot. The first responders engaged the terrorists, but were flat out outgunned. Al-Shabaab is the same group that attacked a mall in Nairobi years ago, killing many innocent people. And now they're threatening attacks here on U.S. soil, threatening the Mall of America. DHS has investigated the group and found them to be no credible threat. And I hope they're right. But if they're wrong, I'm very happy that we live in a country where we have concealed carriers. He kept pulling the charging handle and hitting the side. The break in gunfire allowed Mealy to pull out his own gun. I saw someone in the back of the Charlotte move, and I knew that if I fired and missed, I could end up hitting them. So Mealy took cover inside a nearby store. I'm not beating myself up because I didn't shoot him, but I know that after he saw me, the, I think the last shot he fired was the one that he used on himself. The gunman was dead. And in the Clackamas shooting, the mere sight of armed opposition forced the gunman to turn the gun upon himself. I guess he didn't want to take the chance of being taken alive. And now we're all asking the same question, how do we combat these mass shootings? Well, the chief of Interpol has come out and said, well, maybe we should just arm the citizens. The people should be able to protect themselves. And I do agree. Now, am I trying to put a firearm in every dorm room in America? No. But if you're somebody of age, of sound mind and body, and you don't have any criminal proceedings, you know, I think you should be able to go out and purchase a gun to keep yourself safe. But not everybody agrees with this point of view, and there are now actually articles out debunking the effectiveness of armed citizens. I have some self-defense stories here, and for the purposes of this report, I restricted this to public people in public places and not private individuals in their homes. We'll start with this one. Back in 2012, two robbers enter an internet cafe, one's holding a, a bat, the other one has a pistol. He jumps up with his own pistol, shoots at the robbers, and chases them out like the rats that they are. You see, guys scurry and pretty pathetic. But he saved the day. Another story from Wisconsin. A gentleman pulls out his concealed carry and then shoots this guy once the coast is clear. Gas station clerk thwarted robbery, fired for violating company's no weapons policy. So this guy, he saved himself and the people in the store, but he lost his job, unfortunately. Another story out of Philadelphia. A barbershop patron shoots gunman dead. Armed robber, no match for pharmacist with a 45. And there are videos accompanying uh, most of these articles I'm showing you. We're just skipping them for the sake of time, but you're welcome to go back and look at them for yourself. Woman fends off would-be attackers with concealed gun. And this is a bank employee with a concealed carry shoot would-be robber in the jaw. Another bank story. Bank customer thwarts robbery after returning to car to grab gun. And we'll end with this one. India's first gun for women fares well among men. And this was in response to the Delhi gang rape of 2012, where the young lady was raped on the bus with an iron rod by several attackers, and now they have a gun specifically designed for the women. I think the gun is way overpriced, but I'm happy to see that the young ladies are carrying this nonetheless and are able to defend themselves. So to anybody who would say that having a firearm does not protect you in a public place, I would want to debunk that and just tell them to go look at this. There are several other examples. Like I said, you can see uh, videos of people in their home. There are way more <laughs> than I can pull up for either one of these cases, but keep this in mind as we go forward and hopefully we can diminish these gun-free zones and get rid of these soft targets. You can find more reports on InfoWars.com. InfoWars Life and InfoWarsLife.com is extremely excited to announce our latest release, Winter Sun, a revolutionary type of vitamin D3. Winter Sun is a premium quality vitamin D3 nutritional supplement. It is produced by extracting oil from healthy, nutrient-dense plants known as lichens. Every batch is analyzed for purity and D3 content. It's completely free of toxins and allergens.